Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Talia Miron Schatz. She is an author, consultant, speaker, and researcher who studies medical decision making in a humanistic way, aiming to guarantee that people understand and are genuinely, genuinely part of their care. So, and today we're going to talk about her book, Your Life Depends on It, What You Can Do to Make Better Choices About Your Health. So, Dr. Miran Schatz, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I have to say that in Europe, I'm a professor. In America, I'm a doctor. So, you understand the difference, and it's great to be here. I was also in Portugal a while ago. I know you're speaking with me right now from Portugal. Um, and it was wonderful. I was, uh, I was the guest of uh, Nudge Portugal. Oh, okay. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very nice. And and thank you for the kind words about Portugal, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, so let's start with this then. Uh, how can psychology contribute for us to have a better understanding of medical decision making? That's that's you know. I, I was going to say it's a great question. It's also it's a big like a huge question. Yeah. I think the first place to start is to understand that when we make medical decisions, we are people, just like we are when we make any other decision. And we have our biases, just with any other decision. And what we also have are special barriers that are atypical. They don't happen when you buy a pair of jeans or when you choose coffee. So let's take these apart a little bit and, and stop me at any point so I don't end up giving a three-hour speech. Okay. So for, for starters, it's important to recognize that we're in a special mental state when we make health and specifically medical choices. So I recently wrote about it for the Wall Street Journal. Um, the title that the editor gave was, Can Patients Decide Their Own Care? Something like that. There, was so, there were hundreds of comments, hundreds, and there was a discussion and letters to the editor, and some people were very relieved to read this, including people from Shared Decision Making and uh, Society for Participatory Medicine, and other people said, what are you talking about? Are you suggesting that I can't make my own decisions? And really angry. Um, of course, I'm not saying, I'm not like pointing at anyone and saying, hey, you can't decide. That's not the point. The point is to say, when we make medical decisions, we are deciding about our body, maybe a disease, maybe a condition that could kill us. We might be scared, we might be in pain, we might be very anxious. This, these are not optimal conditions in which to decide. That's something to remember and that's of course something psychological but it's right there it's right there our encounter with our doctor and then we have all our biases we have system one and system two and people listening to you will know that so i'll give just a very brief explanation um, i worked at princeton university with daniel kahneman i was his postdoc and that was wow an amazing experience and of course one of the things he did among many many other things he wrote a book thinking fast and slow and thinking fast is how we choose a sandwich. You know, like we say, oh, I feel like this, that's it. We, we don't give it too much thought. We don't consider all the data. We just say, I want cheese, that's it. It's fast and it doesn't take into account all the information. And if it says mama's cheese sandwich, more, we're more likely to choose it because it has an emotional flavor. And then there's thinking slow. And thinking slow, we plan and we look at all the sandwiches and what's the caloric content, how much saturated fat. Oh, you know, oh my God, it's like if you have a friend who chooses like that, you never want to go to dinner with them. Yeah. So that's annoying with a sandwich, but that's the right way to choose medical treatments. You would think, except we just said people are anxious, they're confused, they're scared, maybe in pain. And we're not talking about sandwiches and cheese anymore. We're talking about things that we may not understand. It's medical terms. So what do we do? System one, we say, oh, this sounds good, or I think there's hope with that, or I should try it. It's gonna, 
it, it could save me. I'll do this. And, and this is how we decide because we're human. You know, it's, it's important for me to say, I'm not saying, oh, well, some people are stupid. This is how they choose. Never, never, because I know how I choose. And I'm human too. And I made a point of interviewing for my book, patients who are actually physicians. That's their day job. And they too said, I was confused or I couldn't find it in me to say, wait a minute, you didn't ask me about these and these symptoms and they're very important because I was in the patient role. And it's crucial to acknowledge, to understand that. So that's a very, you know, you asked a small question and I gave a rather big answer just about the psychology of being a patient. And if you want, we can, we can also talk about the barriers to good decision making. Mm -hmm. once we're in that place. Sure. But uh, I mean, uh, before that, let me just ask you, to what extent do external factors like, for example, societal factors, legal factors and commercial factors play mm -hmm. a role in how decision making is done? I mean, how, how much importance should we give to those? Well, wow. These are three really good questions. And, and, and they're separate. And, and I'll start with answering another question altogether, because when I say I study medical decision making, people ask me, wait, who is decision making, the patients or the doctors? And I say both of them. And this comes into play. And I'll start with your second question about the legal factors. So as a patient, you know, I, I come to the doctor, I want answers. As a doctor, I want to be legally protected. What do I do? I do a number of things, and they don't always benefit the patient. Some of them benefit the patients in theory because doctors will give us informed consent forms to sign, oftentimes mm -hmm. not to read, to sign. Here, you know, here is a seven-page document. You're going to have surgery in five minutes. Sign it. What are you going to do? You're going to sign it because it's your doctor or your anesthesiologist and do you want to fight with them? I don't, and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you had a problem with your left knee. Well, I, you know, I amputated your right leg, but that's okay, you know, if you, if they, if they, if you made them angry. So you don't argue. And that's just perhaps an exaggeration, but it's an example of how something that is mandated by law is sometimes done in a cursory manner. Some things are more subtle because when a study asked physicians, do you sometimes prescribe medication that you think are unnecessary or tests or procedures? About 20% of the time this happens. And one of the main reasons why this happens is because of legal concerns. So the doctor doesn't really think you need an MRI, but they say, whatever, if I don't prescribe it, maybe I'll be sued down the road let's do it. And that's, and that's a legal reason. So we live in a culture where it's great that we're protected by law. It's great that there is informed consent. All these things are really good. The question is, how are they used and are they really used to our benefit? You also asked about commercial factors. So the same survey that asked doctors, do you do too many things? a significant proportion of them said yes, because I make money off of it. So, you know, nobody's going to cut off somebody's leg because they make money, but why not? You could do physical therapy for your knee. The doctor is not going to see a penny out of this, or you could have surgery. That's big bucks. What are they going to choose? I would hope the answer is whatever's good for you physically and whatever suits your preferences. But the doctor's preferences also get in the way. And again, I, I admire anyone who goes to be a doctor. <clears throat> I really do. It's an incredibly difficult profession. You train so hard to get there. It's really difficult. And along the way, money becomes a factor. And that's, that's something for us to consider. And the first thing you asked was about societal factors. Mm -hmm. Now, this is really, really subtle. The truth is that if you and I go into the ER and you complain of pain, the doctors will say, Ricardo is a white male. He's complaining of pain. He's really in pain. Let's give him painkillers. 
if I complain of pain, the doctor will say, Talia is a woman. She might be hysterical. She might be exaggerating. Maybe it's in her head. And these things happen. It's not, you could say, come on, what is she talking about? It's a thing of the past. We're now in 2021. Maybe you will broadcast this in 2022 and people will be looking at it years into the future, I hope. But this is still the reality. This is how women are viewed. Um, men of color are in a much worse position compared with white men when they complain of pain. Because doctors say, well, I don't know, he's a man of color, maybe he does, he's not really in that much pain, maybe he's after the opioids. This is not me saying it, it's studies saying that. And it's very difficult and it's very subtle because no one will say that to your face, but if you're a black man and you're complaining of pain, you will just have to wait. Nobody will tell you, but it might very well be that you will have to wait. And if you're a woman, it might be that the doc you're more likely to be told, oh, it might be psychological. What does psychological mean? Like I, I, I wrote a story in the book about the Zumba disease and, and uh, I won't tell, but it's, it's a really good story. It's about someone who had numbness in their left arm and left leg. And the doctor didn't know what to do. And they ended up saying, it's psychological. What do you mean? What, what is this? Is this a solution? Are you sending the patient home, basically telling them it's all in your head and it's your fault? Or are you trying to figure this out? And I believe it's more likely to happen to women. And of course, it's, it's very hard to combat. This is something that patients need to be aware of and physicians need to be aware of. And, you know, when I was writing the book, I thought I was writing a book for patients. And I wrote takeaways for patients. And then I thought, Come on, they meet with healthcare professionals. Healthcare professionals should also read the book, and there are also takeaways for healthcare professionals. But then I had another aha moment, and I thought these encounters happen within an organization, within an organization that gives these people time to get to know one another or not, that checks the procedures, that says, wait a minute, this woman and this man came to the ER and complained of the same injury. This is the protocol. I don't care what color they are. They can be black, green, or orange. If they complain of, a, of pain at a level of something, this is what they need to be prescribed. Why isn't this being prescribed? So that's the type of work that needs to be done. And then, you know, when we talk about the barriers, to making good medical choices, obviously, it's not just that if the patient tried harder, they would overcome the barriers, or if the doctor did whatever, um, but it's a bigger, these are bigger problems and they need to be solved on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would like now to ask you about each of the main actors that play a role in medical decision making, mainly, of course, patients and doctors. So especially taking into account the limited knowledge that we expect patients to have, what would mm -hmm. you say uh, could and should be the role played by the patients when it comes to their own medical decisions? So I think they need to understand that, you know, I call the book, Your Life Depends on It, Your Life, Your Body, you know, how to make better choices about your health. So it's their responsibility. That's, that's a very broad thing to say, but it's also very important. Um, I suggest that they take into account several issues. The first one is their relationship with their doctor. They need to feel trust and a connection with a doctor, even if it's very minimal. And I have studies showing that when a woman is giving birth, if she can answer, every effort was made to connect with me emotionally and every effort was made to involve me in the decision-making process, then she will define the delivery as much better than if she wasn't. And the every effort can be very minimal. It can be the doctor saying, I'm very sorry, Ms. Whatever, we have to do an unplanned cesarean delivery. Is that okay? You know, it doesn't take long. I just said it very slowly. I don't think it took five seconds. Now, what's the woman going to say? She's going to say, no, I insist on my birth plan. No, she understands it's an emergency. But she was spoken to. She was related to. She had, even if it was 
you know, almost a fake um, role in the decision making process, she was consulted with. That makes a huge difference. Even if the doctor looks at her and says, I'm here for you. That's it. That's it. Really, it's like two seconds. It makes a difference because there was an emotional connection. So that's, I'm talking about unplanned cesarean delivery, and that's a very, very extreme case. Um, but when we talk about chronic disease care, these things also matter, and they matter a lot. And it turns out that patients, even HIV patients, diabetes patients, people who should really take their medication, are less likely to take their medication if they don't feel connected to their doctor or that their doctor knows them as a person or that they care about their doctor. So you asked about the patient's role, and I think the patient's role is also to understand this, not to say, well, I'm seeing the doctor and my in-laws used to see a doctor that they didn't trust. It drove me crazy. Why would you go to a doctor you don't trust? What's the point? There are many other doctors in town. Seek a doctor that you have a connection with, and you're going to trust them, and you'll adhere to the medication, and you'll feel taken care of. So that's the first thing. And interestingly, it also matters for physicians. So also the physicians want to feel that, hey, my patient came to see me, my patient cares about me, and they listen to me, and it's mutual. It goes both ways. I mean, when, when I teach, and, and I, I used to teach at Wharton, now I teach in Israel, um, and in other places, and I'm visiting research at Cambridge University, and whenever I give a talk or I teach, if I enjoy it, I know that the students enjoyed it. There's no, there's no question about it, because it, it's mutual. It's a relationship. So that's the first thing. It's like you're a patient, find someone you trust. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two has to do with health literacy. So that's our ability to understand health information and also to look for it and to question it, to be critical about it. And our role is to try to understand what our doctor says. Um, the doctor's role we can deal with in a second. Um, we can at least be equipped with a number of things. One of them is a piece of paper and a pen to write down what the doctor says, or better, to ask the doctor to write down the medical terms they are using. Because if you don't do that, you go home and you think, wait, what did they say? I'm not sure. What does it mean? I don't know. So at least have it written down and have them write it down for you. Um, another thing to do is a set of questions, to use a set of questions that I created. I call it Ask About What Matters. And it's simple. And it's simple because when someone says, Mr. Whatever, I have news for you and it's not very good. You know, your mind goes blank and you need something simple to use. That's the first reason. The second reason is we are taught still to respect doctors, which is great. But we're also sometimes in awe of them. We don't ask, like the example I gave with the knee. The doctor says you have to have surgery. If you ask them, are you sure? It's like, are you questioning your doctor? Do you think your doctor doesn't know what they're doing? And I want us to understand that it's our body and we have to take the responsibility to ask questions. So the first question is, what are the risks? You're my doctor, you're offering me something. What are the risks? I should know, right? Because there might be risks. What are the benefits? And how many people will enjoy them? And this is crucial when we talk about cancer treatments. Sometimes the answer is 3%. What? You know, 3%? What are you talking about? Right? So I need to know this if I need if I decide to choose, and whatever I choose is fine. It's my body. But I, as a researcher, I would like people to make informed choices. And this is something that matters to me in my research, and it matters to me a lot in my consulting work, and I work a lot with pharmaceutical companies when they face patients and when they face physicians. And I work with developers and with corporate health, and it always matters to me that people will choose based on knowledge. So what are the risks? What are the benefits? And big question, what are the alternatives? What else could I do? You recommend chemotherapy. What are the alternatives? 
maybe an alternative is not to do anything and just wait and it's almost as good oh my god maybe i'll choose it maybe i won't but i will know and to learn and to educate educate ourselves to ask about alternatives is huge um so what are the risks what are the benefits what are the alternatives these are things that we should always ask we talked about relationship with doctor and health literacy Mm-hmm. And another barrier we encounter is around probabilities. And I, I hinted at it when I just spoke about the cancer treatments. So when we use system one and the doctor says, you know, we could do this for your cancer, we say, yes, yes, anything that would save me. But is it really saving you? You need to know. You need to understand. You need to ask. And the doctor's role and the healthcare system's role is to make sure we understand the answer. Because if they tell a person out of 100 people like you who will take this treatment, three will see a benefit. They'll say, what? I'm sure I didn't understand. Can you say this again? And they'll say it again. Out of 100 people like you who will have this treatment, this chemotherapy, for example, which is very difficult and very unpleasant, three will have added survivorship. Do you still want it? Maybe yes, maybe no, but now you understand. And to be presented with information in a way like this is huge. Because every piece of research will show you that this form of presenting information, it's called frequentist format, yields better understanding. There's just no question about it. The big question is why isn't it used across the board? That's that's the case, but it's a great format for us to use to ask, but tell me, doctor, out of 100 people like me, how many people will see the benefit? Maybe the doctor doesn't know, that's legitimate, but they can find out. And until they find out, we can wait, right? So we said relationship, health literacy, probabilities. And the fourth thing that I write about, and there's a whole chapter about in the book, is choice. Now, choice is so tricky. Why? Because we love it. We love choice. You know, you go to a coffee shop and I'm visiting Amsterdam now so I can choose whatever cake. Fantastic. I don't want to walk into a coffee shop and someone says, Talia, here's your coffee, here's your cake. Oh, don't, I don't care. I don't want to ask you, just that's it. But when it comes to medical treatments, it can be very confusing. It can be confusing, it can be difficult. And in fact, I have a study on atrial fibrillation patients and they get to choose. I did this in the US and they can choose what kind of medication they use. In fact, when we saw what they know about their medication, the ones who knew the most knew around one and a half items of information about the medicine. And when we asked, how did you choose? What, what did you choose based on? A lot of them said the doctor's experience. So in theory, they have the ability to choose. In practice, when given seven different kinds of drugs, they ask the doctor, what do you think I should choose? What's the best? What's your experience? That makes a lot of sense. But this also means that choice can be a barrier to us. And you know, even when you go on shopping websites like Amazon, they can have 30,000 products in a category. They don't say choose out of 30,000 products. They say, here's how you can narrow it down. And I'm just going to show you five in each row. It's human. It's a human scale. So likewise, with health, we need to understand what we're choosing from it to sort of narrow it down and to get help narrowing it down in ways that are suitable to our understanding and to our values and preferences. Mm-hmm. So now when it comes to the doctors, what would we say are some of the most common flaws, particularly when it comes to communicating information to patients? So I want to start by saying I think doctors, especially in the U.S., are in an impossible situation, Mm -hmm. really. Um, They lack the training to discuss things with patients in a simplified and clear manner. They also lack the resources, and the example I gave with probabilities is a great one because there's a wonderful um, communication device that was developed by my colleagues at the Winton Center, the University of Cambridge, and it doesn't exist for everything, 
And it took a lot of time and effort to develop that. So if you're just, if you're a doctor working at your clinic, you have to figure out how to present probabilities to patients in a clear manner. And that's hard. So I think the problems, the flaws, the difficulties that doctors encounter when discussing with patients, because doctors want to do good by their patients, are not forming this connection, just, you know, typing ahead at their EHRs. And I understand them because they have to just lift your eyes and say, hello, hi, Mr. Lopez, what can I do for you today? What brings you here today? How can I help you? Again, it doesn't take a long time, but you have a name, you have a face, I looked you in the eye, I asked you what can I do for you. It's a, it's a different situation than, you know, boom, 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 yes. What's your problem? Your nose hurts, okay. That's, that's very dehumanizing. So that's one thing. Another thing is really to communicate at a simple level. Because patients need First of all, to receive information in a way that they can understand. There's a lot of work on that, and there's a lot of work on health literacy. And now a study came out, and it has it, it became almost famous because it didn't talk about health literacy in the title. It said, rich people benefit more from digital health compared with poor people. But why? Because they have higher literacy, higher health literacy, and higher digital literacy. So when you're developing digital health, you need to think, who is going to use this? What's their literacy level? Am I helping those who understand it a little less, both the, the machine that they're using and the language? And likewise, in a doctor, um, if you talk, for example, about creatinine levels, your patient will not, but they will likely not understand what you're talking about. If you say it looks like you're dehydrated, your patient can say, you know, you're right, because in the summer I walk around with a water bottle, but now it's the winter, so I don't, I, oh my God, I barely drink throughout the day. Is this a problem? I didn't realize it. How much should I drink? A whole different conversation um, takes place where two people are talking and they understand one another. So we have the connection, we have the literacy, we have the probabilities, and with choice, I think it's, it's the doctor's role to help with choosing. Actually, it's really, really interesting. There's a philosopher from Oxford University, and he shared uh, a paper that he wrote with me about, fidu about fiduciary responsibility, basically saying it's okay if a patient gives their responsibility to the doctor and says, you know what, doctor, could you please choose for me? And this is not paternalism. It's very different from the doctor saying, do this. It's the patient saying, I'm not sure what to choose. You have the expertise. Do this. Help me, please. And I can, and I can accept your advice or not accept your advice, but I'm asking for it. And in fact, there's a really beautiful YouTube video from Baba Shiv, who's a marketing professor at the University of Stanford. You can say, seriously, he can't choose? The truth is, and he's very candid about it, he talks about his wife having had cancer treatments. And he said, we decided to take a back seat. We decided to let the doctors choose. And, and there are many reasons there. So one is the complexity of the, the decision, and other is that when you decide, you experience regret, they chose not to go there, but to just let the doctors choose. And, and I'm giving him as an example because I want to say these difficulties happen to everybody. They can happen to a smart marketing professor from the University of Stanford. And if this is the case, then the healthcare system needs to be ready for this, needs to be ready for all of us, either saying, I want to decide on my own or help me decide or decide for me. And I think all of these forms are legitimate. Um, there's a whole movement of shared decision-making. And one of the beautiful things about it is that you can take it up a notch and say, we're not just choosing what to do, we're choosing how to choose. And as a patient, it's your life, it's your body. You can say, doctor, help me or choose for me or I wanna choose. That's, they're all legitimate.
Mm -hmm. So, and what about when it comes to social and political nudges? Do you think that's something we could apply to improve medical decision making? Well, as I mentioned, I'm right now in the Netherlands and there are riots in Rotterdam against vaccinations. This is something that COVID really brought to the forefront of our lives. Maybe a few years ago, this would have been a hypothetical discussion. Right now, it's a very real discussion. Um, a, the most boring term on earth, public health, suddenly became something that determines our life. Can you leave your house? If you have kids, can they go to school? Uh, can you go to a party? If you were going to get married in a 500 guest uh, celebration, is this going to happen? So all of a sudden, this makes a huge difference. And if you ask me, my personal opinion is that nudges do help and can help. And for me, the key to using them is, first of all, using them in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a libert libertarian paternalism sort of way. And that is to say, why am I using this? I'm using this because I think it's better for you and better for society. And you know, a great example in my mind is COVID vaccinations. Some people disagree, but also organ donations. If God forbid I need an organ, it would be really great for me, for my selfish purposes, that many people are donors because then I'm more likely to get a kidney or a heart or whatever it is that I need. So it's better for me to live in a society with many organ donors and it's also better for society because everyone wins. Whenever a person needs an organ, they're more likely to have it. So that's the paternalistic part, which tells me, Talia, we're going to opt you in. Um, the libertarian part is me saying, oh, no, I don't want I want to I want to save my kidneys after I die. I don't know what for, but whatever. Um, I just, I'm very passionate about this. I gave a, a keynote for Donate Life America and I was passionate about that even before. So that's paternalism. And yes, I do think nudges can help a lot. And nudges will not change the mind of people who are very adamantly against either vaccinations or organ donation, but they will change the minds of those in between. I think it's the role of government to intervene because government will intervene anyway. And that's, you know, really, really interesting. In the Netherlands, right now, stores close at six, restaurants close at eight, and tomorrow they will be announcing new restrictions for everybody, everybody. Um, already they have restrictions. I was in a beautiful park this morning. I went to have tea and they checked my QR code to see that I was vaccinated. So already there are restrictions in place. Right now, there are two kinds of restrictions, right? I chose to vaccinate so I can go have coffee, but I did not choose for the restaurant to close at eight. That's something that applies to everybody. So everybody, you know, I can't say suffers when a restaurant closes, it's not the end of the world, but there are consequences for everybody. And that's governmental policy. In Austria, they want to have lockdown only for people who didn't vaccinate. And people get very, very angry. And I said, but in the Netherlands, everybody suffers. So is this fair? Is that fair? What are we fighting against? Are we fighting against the evil government or are we fighting against a disease that kills people? Are we fighting against the vaccinations or against COVID? So in a way, the government always has a role. Sometimes it chooses to take a back seat and not to not to act on this role in an active way. But yes, I think that nudges can help. And sometimes we even expect them to work. I mean, sometimes we don't just expect nudges, we expect the law. When I go, when I walk, I expect people to, who drive to have a driver's license. I expect them not to be drunk. I expect them not to speed. I want someone to protect me. In the realm of driving, we think this is very acceptable and very obvious. In the realm of health, we are more used to saying it's my body. That's true, but if it's my body and I have COVID and I give it to other people who aren't vaccinated or 
I get sick and then the numbers of sick people in my country are so high that the country has to go into lockdown, then it's not just my own personal issue. Um, by the way, I anticipate this. I don't know if it will happen, but it will happen for sure. It's just a question of when that this will get to diabetes, to obesity, to other things that have a societal effect or will have a societal effect down the road. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, to what extent do you think we should hold people responsible for their own health outcomes, taking into account that we have to consider all these other external factors like the ones we talked about, including the social? I think we need to do two things in parallel, and one actually happens by nature. So if you choose, if someone chooses not to exercise, um, not to watch their weight, to eat unhealthy food, too much sugar, too much salt, too much fat, too much soda, they're going to be not too healthy. Maybe not the first day, but 20 years down the road, at throw in some smoking, throw in some alcohol drinking, they're not going to be very healthy. It's not going to be fun when they're coughing from the smoking, when they can't go up the stairs, when they're just heavy and it feels unpleasant, when they develop high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one path. And some of it is natural. And some of it will happen through employers who say, well, you know, if this is the path you take, your premium is going to be higher because you're going to be less healthy and you're going to cost me more in health expenses. And it happens in the U.S. because it's a free market approach. Um, it doesn't really happen elsewhere, but it's a question. Will it or will it not happen? And that's the personal responsibility path. Another path is the social responsibility path. And that path says we want people to exercise. We want people to be healthy. Not because we're nice. Forget that. That's not... That's not great, that's a wonderful motivation, but maybe not very convincing in economic terms. Why do we want people to be healthy? Because then they're productive. We don't lose them to sick days. We don't have to pay so much for hospitalizations, for medication, for nursing, et cetera. So it's selfishly for the country, for the healthcare systems, we want people to be healthy. How do we promote that? I'm in the Netherlands. There are bicycle paths everywhere. 79% of kids get to school on a bike. Now these kids can't be obese. They ride their bike everywhere. They don't, they don't have time or the ability to become obese. They're constantly in movement. Okay, but the, gov the, the kid is on the bike and you see the kid on the bike, but you, what you don't see is the government creating that bicycle path everywhere, literally everywhere to make it very convenient. Um, what are you subsidizing? If you're a government, are you subsidizing high fructose corn syrup or are you subsidizing fruits and vegetables? It's a question, right? If you don't have much money and you buy potato chips in a huge bag for $1.59, can I blame you? I would be a hypocrite if I blamed you. Because if I said you should buy this and this and that, you would say, well, it's very nice of you, but your list is going to cost me 10 times more than the potato chips. So that's a question. You know, where, where are we placing the responsibility? What are we teaching kids? What are we giving them to eat in school cafeterias? Um, what are we allowing advertising of? It's, these, are, these are big, big questions. And oftentimes governments say, it's not, it's not my job. You want to have potato chips, have potato chips. And of course, I don't want the police to come knocking on my door if I have potato chips, but I do want to live in a society where someone says, I want you to be healthy and I'm going to help you. Okay, so it's, it's two things. The person exercising will always have to be me. The person eating healthy food will have to be me. The person having um, alcohol at the level of the WHO recommendations or below will have to be me, always, and not smoking, etc., cetera, et cetera, but I need help. We all need help. Some of us need more help than others, and it's a question of who is out there to give us this help, or are we saying, well, good luck, you know, 
I believe in you, but not really providing you with the tools and the support for doing that. Because if the kids in the Netherlands didn't have bicycle paths, their parents would have to drive them to school and we would be looking at a different society. Mm-hmm. So, uh, one last question then, and since we're talking about medical decision making, and we've already mentioned here some of the psychological biases behind it, system one, system two, the yeah. knowledge limitations of the patients, and perhaps sometimes being too, tr- uh, too trustful, and the fact that also doctors sometimes do not really work in optimal conditions, and so it's expected for them to make a few mistakes at least. Uh, what do you think about the possibility of incorporating AI systems in, in medical decision making? And do you think that potentially they could do a better job than doctors? I, it's already here. Hmm. It's literally already here. So I was at uh, the health conference, HLTH. Where was it? In Boston. <laughs> I travel so much, it gets confusing. So it was in Boston just recently, and I went because I also am very involved with with uh, the industry, as I mentioned, and I wanted to see how companies were doing and to connect with, with clients and collaborators. And uh, I met companies that look at patients' charts and summarize them for, patient, for physicians and say, these are the main things. These are the main issues with this, with this patient. These are things to notice. And I think that's absolutely fine. It happens considerably. Um, It happens all the time because there is so much data that is generated. And people need help. People are patients, but also doctors. So if you highlight to them what they need to look at, that's going to be incredibly helpful. And obviously, it also comes with a paternal, paternal, libertarian, paternalistic approach where you don't force the doctor. I mean, if you force the doctor, then you don't need the doctor anymore. But you do need the doctor. You do need the doctor's consideration and expertise. But just to show them the data and to say, this is the patient, they've been on this medication for a long time, their blood pressure is spiking. Or notice that they just got a new drug for their liver and it may interact poorly with whatever. The doctor can notice that. So definitely, this future is here. We also know that doctors don't always like it. Sometimes they prefer to view things on their own. And I think that's a wonderful example where psychology is needed. Because if you want a person, be they a patient or a doctor, to use anything, think about their motivations. Think about how how they are going to understand this and how they are going to feel about this. And if the doctor feels that you're telling them, I know you're busy, I know you're smart, here's how I capture the data, look at it and use it to the best of your ability. It's here to help you. That's very different from saying, I know better than you, which everybody hates to hear, right? So that's just to say, and I I love this question because AI is so smart. But AI, and, and it was great, I, was, I gave a webinar recently and someone asked a question about AI and actually the person in charge of health research at IBM Research was there. And I said, why don't you ask, answer the question? And she did and she said, the truth is that we don't really incorporate health behaviors so much into our models. So that's another thing, that's another place to go. And the next step will be to convince people to take these to take these steps and to improve their health through AI or other means. So I think there's great hope there. I think it's not just going to happen smoothly. I think there's a lot of psychology that needs to be integrated into these systems, but definitely we would be we would be ignorant not to recognize the role that AI is going to have and already has in medical decision making. Mm-hmm. Very well. So the book is again, Your Life Depends on It, What You Can Do to Make Better Choices About Your Health. Uh, Apart from the book, Dr. Miron Schatz, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Absolutely. So I have a website. It's taliamironschatz.com. 
T-A-L-Y-A-M-I-R-O-N-S-H-A-T-Z.com. And I created it so that people would know not just what I do, but would have access to lots of information and interviews and webinars and really great resources about nudges, about health equities or inequities, and a lot of information that's out there for smart podcast listeners and viewers to reach. And they can reach out to me through the website as well. Okay, so thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure as well. Obrigada. Hi guys, thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Lenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, My Producer, Zizar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Staffini, Akion Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardes France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.